God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. We're looking at uh, John Wesley and some of his sermons this month, and uh, we move to the next one he preaches, and, and he, uh, he is preaching about this moment with Paul, this moment when Paul is in really hot water, this moment when Paul has been arrested because he has uh, gone to the temple uh, and, and there's a riot has started just for him being there. And from there he goes to the local chief of police, he gets interrogated, he goes to the governor, he go, ends up before the king being interrogated, being questioned, why, why are people fighting about you, Paul? And, and he's explaining to... Um, Agrippa, the king, he's explaining to this, to this king Agrippa that, you know, I, I, my name is Paul, I was a, a Jewish a rabbi, a Jewish teacher, and, and I was persecuting Christians, and, and then Jesus backhanded me, and now I, I'm uh, doing Christ's work. And, and you know, it, you know it turns to Agrippa telling a story, and says, you know, Agrippa, King Agrippa, you know about the Jewish prophets, right? And, and, and start, starting to turn and maybe ask uh, Agrippa what he might believe and, and this is Agrippa's response you almost had me you almost got me you almost had me interested you almost persuaded me to be a Christian but not today and then he he leaves the room makes a decision about Paul's legal situation and, and that's that this uh, this moment is what John Wesley latches on to when he is going to preach his last sermon at Oxford. We, we catch uh, Wesley when he preaches a sermon. It's called the, the Almost Christian, when he is preaching what turns out to be his last sermon at Oxford. And the passages he presents is that first one, that in these last days the world is going to be full of liars and cheats and scandals and scuzzballs and... and and then almost thou persuaded me to be a Christian. And then he launches into this sermon, and he is told it's going to ruffle some feathers, it's not going to go over well, and it didn't. And uh, that's his last sermon as a, as a, pre, as a professor at, at Oxford. You see, he's at this moment where he's about to make a, a change in his life. He has uh, been doing the academic thing for a bit, but at this point, they've built their first Methodist preaching house. And to give Wesley credit, they built their first house, and uh, this has nothing to do with the sermon. I just find it fascinating. Uh, they charged tax based not on square footage for the property tax, but on the number of windows. And so if you had a seven-window building, that was a higher tax than a two-window building. And Wesley had built his first preaching house, and he'd put one window in the top, put mirrors to direct the light down, put mirrors at the bottom to kick the light out. And so he built this big old preaching house with one mirror that... Uh, Wesley, smart dude. But uh, he has his preaching house he's built. He has a couple dozen people who are following him and starting some small groups. And, and he's going to do it. He's going to go off and he's going to start what turns into the Methodist revival. And, and he is leaving academia. He has this last chance to preach. And, and he's leaving Oxford where he was teaching. And he's not just leaving Oxford, he's leaving the place where he had been mocked. Right? Methodist, never forget, Methodist was originally an insult. Right? Why are you so darn methodical? Why can't you relax? He was also, they were also called Bible moths and other terms of, de, of uh, derogatory terms I, I'm not going to repeat. But, uh, so he's leaving academia. This place has mocked him for taking Jesus seriously. And, and so he gets one last turn and he just lays into him. He just really leans on him. He starts this sermon and he says, Are you an almost Christian? Or are you an altogether Christian? Are you an almost Christian? Are you an almost Christian? I mean, you might have some basic honesty. He calls it heathen honesty. You might have some basic heathen honesty. You might have some general sense of justice. You might help people when it doesn't cost you anything. That's good. But that's not altogether Christian. You might go to church. You might not break the Ten Commandments. You might not gossip. You might even pray and read the Bible. Don't seek revenge. You might do uh, everything that looks Christian, that, that phrase in 2 Timothy. You might have the form of godliness. He's talking about hypocrites here, in case that wasn't clear. You might look the good look. You might talk the good talk. You might walk the good walk. But that's not, that's almost Christian. What is an altogether Christian? He looks at him and says, you've got to have the love. You've got to love Jesus. You've got to love God. You've got to love God with your whole heart and mind and soul and strength. That has to be your delight, to be thankful to God and rejoice in God. 
Right? And it's not just the love of God, it's the love of neighbor. Right? Love, your, love the God, Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you don't have that love, right, that love that's described it's in 1 Corinthians 13, the love that is patient and kind and gentle, if you don't have the love, you are not a Christian. You're an almost Christian, but you're not an altogether Christian. Right? He leans into him on that. And by the end of the sermon, it is very clear that Wesley has basically taken the entire staff of Oxford, all the professors, all the tenured professors, all the people who are like the upper crust, the, uh, the finest minds of London and of Britain. He's looked at them and said, you know, you might give your staff, your servants, a nice check at, Christi at Christmas, but do you really love Jesus? I'm not sure you really do. I'm not sure there are many Christians out there in this congregation today Better get your life together. Amen. Did I tell you the sermon didn't go over so well? <laughs> but that's uh, 1741 is when he preaches that sermon, July 25th. And he goes off to lead what becomes the Methodist revival. A few dozen people, a few preachers, and one preaching house, and off he goes. Forty-six years later, he comes back to the same topic. Forty-six years later. Have you ever done anything for 46 years such that you can go back and look at what you once did? Right? I'm 36, so I have a little while to go before I can do that. I have to be in my 70s before I can go back and look at these sermons. But um, he goes back, dude lived till, his, till he was 90. Uh, he goes back 46 years later in 1787. And it's a very different situation. He writes this sermon, and it's not a sermon that he, he delivers as the parting blow to, uh, to uh, Oxford before he goes off to start the, the movement, the Methodist movement. It is instead a, a sermon that is printed in the Methodist newspaper, because now there are Methodist newspapers. And they get sent out via the 200 Methodist preachers, and they go to 60,000 Methodists. In 47 years to go from three or four dozen people to 60,000, that's impressive. Right? So he has 60,000 Methodists who are waiting to read his sermon. So he writes this sermon for them. He sends it all across Britain. And it goes to Ireland and it goes to America as well. And so it's a different time, a different congregation too. He's not preaching. It's not the angry sermon of a man who just needs to get people to take Jesus seriously. That and Wesley talked at one point about how he would light himself on fire so that people would come to watch him burn. And, and that's not like self-immolation. He's not going to get any gas and, and torch himself. But the idea of being so full of the Holy Spirit and so committed that people are just going to come to see this extravagant sight. And they're going to catch on fire. And here we go. And, and dude's in his late 80s now. That fire has kind of, it, it's, it's kind of burned down a bit. The, the love of God is still there. But he writes this, this sermon, this second sermon, 47 years later. He calls it the most excellent way. And he writes, you know, there are people who have the form of godliness, and, and, you know, and it's going to be God's call who saves, if, if they are saved or not. It's going to be God's call. He goes on to say, uh, and I quote, I would encourage them, those who have the form of godliness, to come higher, without thundering hell, without damnation in their ears, without condemning the way in which they were, telling them it is a way that leads to destruction. I will endeavor to point out to them what is in every respect a more excellent way. For those who walk a more excellent way will have a more excellent reward. It's a, it's a pretty amazing shift to go from, if you don't burn with the love of Jesus, you are burning, right? To, you know, I got something better for you. And I'm not going to lean on you. I'm not going to threaten you. I'm just going to tell you, this, this is a lot better. And, and he starts to lay out, he, he's laying this out to these people, and he's talking to all these Methodists, 60,000 Methodists, and um, they're people, they've already agreed, they've already drank the Kool-Aid, they're already along for the ride, right? They, they already love Jesus, and now he's just inviting them to do a little bit more. And he starts to lay out this very, a list of very practical things. He says, you know, do you sleep in? You know you don't need more than eight hours of sleep, just get up. Get up a decent time in the morning and, and get to praying. And, and while you're at it, did your prayers grow up? Right? Are, you still preach, are you still praying the same prayers you did when you were seven? Right? It's time, make sure your, your prayers are time for them to grow up as well. And, and your work, when you go to work, everyone has to work. When you go to work, do you work just to feed your family? Or do you embrace the more excellent way and you see that everyone who walks in the door is a neighbor who you can love as Jesus directs? Can you be the most graceful person in that, per, in that whoever walks in the door, can you just be graceful to them that day? Do you, when you sit down to eat, do you eat to excess 
and quickly? Or do you sit down with someone else and do you really pay attention to them? Do you pay attention and have graceful conversation that is edifying? Right? When you entertain yourself, do you sit down in front of the TV and just check out? He doesn't actually talk about the TV. It's the 18th century equivalent. But do you sit down at the TV and check out? Or, or do you go talk to your neighbor? Do you go work in the garden? Do you go play some music? Do you do something that is edifying and builds up in the more excellent ways to spend your time? And then he lands on money. Wesley always has a lot to say about money. He says, you know what, do you give your tithe or have you figured out how to give more? The more excellent way is to figure out how to give more and more year after year. He, he points out there's a Methodist who lived on 28 pounds a year and made 30 pounds a year. And the next year he made 28 pounds a year, so he gave away 32 pounds. He, he made twice as much. He went from making 30 pounds to 60 pounds, but he still lived on 28 pounds. And then he went to, the Methodist went to making 90 pounds a year, and he still lived on 28 pounds. And the guy, he started, so he got into the fullness of his life, and he started making 120 pounds a year every year, and he still lived on 28 pounds, so he could give the other 92 away every year. Right? And so can, uh, can you, the more excellent way is to learn to give more and more so that you might help more and more. All right, and this is just such an amazing difference that, that 46, 47 years makes. Wesley is not striving to deliver a swift kick in the rear. Right? He is helping people who have already sort of gotten going get going a little bit further down the road. Right? He's trying to help people love God and love neighbor in a very practical way. Right? And it's not that he doesn't it's not that he doesn't believe what he said 40-odd years ago. He never stops printing that sermon. That first sermon, the, the almost Christian, right? the angry sermon, the sermon of, of are you, do you really burn with the love of God and the love of neighbor, that still continues to be the sermon that, that if you're going to start as a Methodist pastor, that's the second sermon you read. It's still the sermon that you're going to start, one of the sermons you're going to start with. But down the road, it's just, you just don't need that all your life, do you? I think that's the interesting thing to hold these two sermons next to each other and be aware that there is probably a point in all of our lives where we need someone to point down the road and yell out, charge, and let's go because we love, love God and let's make a difference. And there are times when a lot more often we just need some help getting one more step down the road. I, uh, I remember, there is one sermon I distinctly remember as the sermon that got my butt in gear. Right? It was the sermon that to this day I do not forget because it, it was a very similar thing. It was a, a second year seminary student at Duke preaching to his professors. And he looks at all the professors and all the students out there and he says to them, you can't give what you don't got. To this day I remember that phrase and I remember thinking, whoo, that's got some heat on it. But he was right. If you don't got the love of Jesus in your life, you cannot give it. If you don't have the prayers and the studies and the service in your life as a pastor, you can't give it. And to this day, that was the kick in my butt. I will never forget. That still drives me, that one sermon. Right? But I only needed it once. What I need far more often is the sermon on, and here's how you might do a bit better. Right? Here's how you might be a little bit more holy. Here's how you might be a little bit more gracious, gracious and, and, and patient. And uh, Some of you might know Friday was my 10-year anniversary. God help her. She's been putting up with me for a decade. And um, when we first got married, I told Olivia, you know, I want to be a good husband, so if I'm doing anything wrong, you tell me. And she did exactly what I told her. Right? She told me, and I'd asked for it, right? And after, I think it was a few weeks... I finally had to sit down and say, Olivia, I can't do it. I can work on one thing at a time, right? I can either work, and Wesley has that list, I can either work on getting up, I could work on prayer, I could work on being better about how I eat, I could work on being better with my money, I can, be work, I can work at being more patient, but I can't do it all at once. One thing at a time. And 10 years later, I think I'm slightly more gracious and a little bit more patient. And, and, and I'm a, one thing at a time, I have gotten better. One thing at a time. Right? I, I don't know which one you need to hear today. I don't know whether you need the pre preaching version of, of a swift kick in the rear to get you going to love Jesus and love your neighbor. I don't know if instead you need something afar, just more gracious, more like that later sermon 46 years down the road. Just, you know, folks, what, what's the next thing you need to do? To, to, to be a little bit more loving in your life. What's the next thing you need to do? Is it about waking up earlier? Is it about war, how you work? Is it about how you eat? Well, whatever it is. I think the best thing to know, for me at least, 
is that we need both, right? You need both, and, and as we keep on coming back, we're going to hear both, but we're going to hear a lot more of that later, because uh, we only need so many swift kicks in the butt, don't we? Amen.